from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good late afternoon. I'm John Cole. I'm the director of the Center for the Book in the Library of Congress, and I would like to welcome you to uh, a Books and Beyond uh, presentation uh, by the, sponsored by the Center for the Book and the Library's Publishing Office. Uh, the Center for the Book is the reading and literacy promotion arm of the Library of Congress, and we promote books and literacy around the country through state centers for the book and other organizations. Uh, we also uh, sponsor the new Library of Congress Literacy Awards, which are funded by David Rubenstein. And we also feature noontime talks about brand new books related to the Library of Congress, uh, which in this case, as you know, is a wonderful book titled The Forgotten Fifties. And I'll be the first one to say that we're also gone back to the technology of the 50s <laughs> for this presentation. It was all part of a plan. So we are pleased you're here. We are going to stick with our basic agenda, which would be a uh, presentation, uh, a brief period for questions and answers, if we have time, because we need to start the book signing at about 1 o'clock. But I'd like to remind you that we do film all of these programs for the Library of Congress's website. And assuming that we are able to squeeze in a brief question and answer period in which we hope you participate, uh, your participation, in effect, is giving us permission to perhaps include you as part of the website presentation. Uh, with that in mind, I'd like you to please turn off all things electronic and to uh, settle in for a interesting kind of audio-visual presentation uh, to uh, get us started. And as I said, we're very pleased to have the publishing office as a co-sponsor, and you will hear uh, not only from members of the staff, uh, but you will also have a wonderful chance to see this terrific uh, Library of Congress resource, uh, the Look Magazine collection. To get us started, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Tom Weiner, who is from the publishing office and is the actual editor of this volume. And Tom will handle uh, the introductions of our other participants and orchestrate the audio-visual show that you are about to see. <laughs> Tom, let's give Tom a hand. I know I don't look like Vanna White, but I'm going to play her in a few minutes here. We had these posters made up as a kind of visual aid to the presentation of the book festival, and it turns out we actually need them today. So without further ado, I'm going to get started and uh, tell you something about how this book came about. The Forgotten Fifties was conceived 10 years ago when Amy Paston, our photo editor, suggested to Ralph Eubanks who's the former director of the library's publishing office, that the Look Magazine collection in the library's prints and photographs division would make an invaluable resource for a book. A few years later, Ralph and Jim Conway, our author, were discussing book ideas, and the idea of focusing on the 1950s came up. Ralph later wedded that idea to Amy's suggestion, and he brought Amy and Jim together to work on a proposal for a book about the 1950s using Look photographs. Look magazine was published between 1937 and 1971. It was a large format general interest magazine whose pages focused as much on photography as on words. Look was owned by the Coles family who published newspapers in Iowa and Minnesota, though the editorial offices for this magazine were in New York. The Library of Congress acquired the magazine's photo archive after Look closed in 1971. The Look Collection is the largest single collection in the library's prints and photographs division with an estimated 5 million items. Although its photographs have been used in publications before ours, the Forgotten Fifties makes the most extensive use uh, to date of the Look Collection, with over 150 photos credited to Look. We also used about two dozen other pictures from the P&P collections. 
So what was a typical issue of look? Well, there were articles on women's fashion and beauty, on movie and television stars, on what the magazine dubbed all American cities, and you'll learn about that in a minute in detail, and on sports. In the 1950s, when the magazine really hit its stride, it also ran features on the Cold War and the rise of Joseph McCarthy and the Red Scare he personified. Also on race relations, in the aftermath of 1954's Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court decision and on women's issues. The magazine frequently took the temperature of the country with features like, what's on America's mind? For this series of articles, which ran in 1951, Look sent four staff photographers to every state in the country, and the result was an evocative portrait of a country which six years after the end of World War II was caught up in another much more bewildering conflict in Korea. We chose to call this book The Forgotten Fifties in reaction to nostalgia for that decade, which has persistently glossed over its darker and more complex features. Many politicians and cultural commentators tout the 50s as a simpler and more prosperous time in this country. But the creators of this book believe it was a deceptively simple time. And we know that not everyone shared in that decade's fabled prosperity. When I started working on this project, Ralph told me, this book is not about the happy days 50s. This book is about the madman 50s. Yes, Look carried plenty of articles and photos to reinforce the Richie Cunningham view of that decade. But they also carried reporting and photography that reflected a Don Draper view as well. Forgotten in our title also refers to Look's place in our cultural memory. After its demise in 1971, Look didn't have the staying power of its more popular competitor, Life Magazine. In this book, we've tried to show how Look provided a unique view of the 50s, not overtly political, but also bolder and more courageous than might be expected for a large circulation glossy magazine. And thanks to Amy's diligence, Many Look collection photographs in the Forgotten 50s have, were ne never even published in the magazine. The Forgotten 50s revisits what some historians have called a crucial decade, a time of immense contrast and social turmoil. We found a number of dramatic pictures of a man in Mississippi named J.W. Malam, acquitted of murder because he was white and his victim was a young black boy named Emmett Till of a Little Rock family protesting the immigration of Central High School. And, oops. And of many other aspects of the 50s. I'm going to shorten my introduction here so we can move on. I want to introduce Jim Conaway, who is going to do some readings from the book. He wrote the text in reaction to the photographs. And I'll do as best I can hold up the photographs he's talking about from the posters we've made. So without further ado, Jim Conaway. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 1950s. Uh, I think the fact that we don't have PowerPoint is right in keeping with the subject matter. So we'll just pretend that we're really here. I wanted to say a word about the uh, voice in this book, which is a narrative. We decided to do it year by year, starting in 1950 through the end. I had to come up with some way to do it. This isn't your ordinary history of a period. It's really an impressionistic take on one person's reaction to the photographs that Amy was able to dig up after we went through copies of the magazine and saw what was available and what we wanted. And I decided that the best way to do this, the only way and the most fun way to do this would be to assume a kind of first person plural voice, whereas the person looking at this, not, not so much one person looking at the magazine and thumbing through it, but sort of an accumulation of people and points of view that I had to sort of build up in my head as kind of an average, somewhat well-educated, somewhat skeptical American who had other things on his or her mind than just reading a magazine the way most of us, even when I was a kid, would go through magazines and turn the pages. So without further ado, we're going to have the first picture 
Thanks, Tom. You think I'm tall, huh? <laughs> so I would just I just looked at this picture and reacted to it and tried to transcend uh, the years. Those hats, not the fact that so many men wear them, but their uniformity. Squarely positioned, broad-brimmed, but not too broad. Looking good matters, although none of the men on the train platform seems aware of mirrors or anything else that might interfere with their own orderly procession into Park Forest, Illinois, one of Look's all-American cities. The hats vary slightly, different dents, crowns, colored bands, but it co collectively comprise a vast ambulatory canopy above the city's and the nation's malehood, protecting it as much from powerful forces difficult to comprehend as from rain and sun. Let the face determine brim width, Look advises men looking for a hat. Correct business attire demands a hat. Buying and wearing one meet the two clear overriding social concerns in the dead center of the American century, conformity and consumption. The Honeymooners has now been a sketch on Jackie Gleason's show for five years. So popular they're making it into a series all its own. This intimate glimpse into the lives of two couples in the same apartment building is supposed to be about domesticity in urban America, but it seems to be more about affection, perseverance, and the absurdity of ambition at the bottom of the economic ladder. Gleason volcanically rages at Art Carney, but quickly runs out of steam. His dreams and endless frustrations hilarious and touching. Carney's vest, t-shirt, and hat with the upturned brim are as alien to the suburbs as Gleason's busman's jacket, like the grim efficiency of the walk-up flat, garishly improved for color television. Carney's, Carney's patience is saintly, as if he instinctively accepts the limitations Gleason can't, the two of them just lovable, hapless boy men. They're yoked in an emerging portrait of an alternative American male who has nothing in common with the supposedly real men we see in the car and clothes ads. At the conclusion of the last war, 800,000 women were fired from jobs in aircraft, automotive, and other industries to make way for men. Women belong in the home now, using their pretty heads to advance their husbands' careers. They try to look sexy and housebound at the same time, one-piece bathing suits for beauty contests and for sitting in the kiddie pool in leafy neighborhoods far from the city. Skirts are long, underwear powerfully conforming. Matrons look matronly, but then so do teenagers, many of whom are taking up sewing two-piece patterns. Women still on America's assembly lines look neither matronly nor, even if pretty, remotely like the women on magazine covers who seem to have been poured into molds dusted with pancake makeup. Teeth preternaturally white, their auroras of hair luminously, lusciously blonde, their good humor painfully intense. Even surfers and their girlfriends at Waikiki Beach and busy young Americans rolling eggs or whatever on weekends seem desperate to enjoy themselves. A 19-year-old model featured in look, long leg lean as a sapling scrubbed, works hard, rides and dances, sings in a choir, can't wait to get married. She's already got her man. Movies reflect an unsettling, almost entirely white, cinematic America in a way they haven't before. Asphalt Jungle belongs to the old conforming order of low-class white criminals in their own world, with heavy Sterling Hayden and a striking young actress, Marilyn Somebody. But there's a new type of troubling actor very much in our world, like Montgomery Cliff. 
what's he looking at in that photograph anyway? Not at us, that's for sure. At nothing's more like it. But nothing is what Americans don't want to see, although many of us are intrigued by actors who look distracted, overly serious, unpredictable, impossible to ignore, bad. Cliff's kind of puny and wears a wrinkled white t-shirt instead of something with a collar. He's sucking on a finger, behavior unimaginable in a Bob Hope or a Bing Crosby, who's often photographed with a perfectly normal Chesterfield between his fingers, his lazy eyes focused archly and familiarly on the lens. His song, Chattanooga Shoeshine Boy, is right above Frank Sinatra's Good Night Irene on the charts, but it's hard to imagine Cliff singing anything. Are these new actors influenced by an ism? Could existentialism have something to do with the fact that the glass of milk in front of Cliff's untouched? You get the feeling he doesn't intend to drink it. Not exactly un-American, but different. Like those paperbacks on the breakfast table. That's the end of that. In the South, we're pretty close to slavery. That's according to a shocking article by a Negro reporter named Carl Rowan, who visits and finds that the color of my skin counted above all things. He discovered dismal, dismal squalor and had old wounds opened. Look at those black kids without shoes and white babies with new ones sitting on the laps of black nannies whose expressions say more than any words, not just their inequality and doubt, but also perseverance and could that be irony? Wives and children need to look good, but to be protected also and have some fun. Kids in the portable pool on the lawn are rambunctious, but not too. Their bodies bright in the sun, the shadows starkly defined. There's something touching about the little boy's eyeglasses, like his seriousness. He's going to enjoy himself, period. Mom has her own pool and is reading a magazine, either enjoying or improving herself, maybe both. Her arms are propped on the blow-up pool sides and the bright plaid one-piece bathing suit and sunglasses become her. So do the raised knee and polished toenails. There's another empty blow-up pool on a neighbor's porch leaning against the wall. It's hot in Park Forest and everybody's going to make the best of it when they get the chance. Down. Here's Joe McCarthy again, foremost scourge of communists in America, taken on by the foremost broadcast newsman, Edward R. Murrow, hero of the airwaves during the Nazi Blitz of London. Murrow's closing line then, good night and good luck, is still his signature on television. Murrow criticized McCarthy's methods and claims of a widespread communist conspiracy in America, most everything about Murrow. Thick hair, chiseled Thick, dark, chiseled hair, angular face, dour expression is in contrast to McCarthy, whose moon-like visage and five o'clock shadow are now well known to Americans. So are the wisps of hair that fall over his forehead as he denounces people in the State Department, in the military, in that relentless monotone. He calls Murrow the cleverest of the jackal pack after Murrow's broadcast, which is hard for anybody to believe. More important, McCarthy failed to address any of Murrow's criticisms. The patience and the sympathy of Americans is peeling away from old Joe like his follicles. I skipped that. I skipped that. A possibility for president is that influential senator from Texas, Lyndon Johnson, the big profane Democrat, who has a ready answer for Luke's question, can a Southerner be elected president? The answer is yes. 
but Southern politicians have been tainted by the furor over continuing segregation and their reluctance to speak clearly about race. Then, as Luke has shown us, Texas isn't really Southern, but rather a world into itself. A stronger candidate might be found up north in the higher reaches of wealth and privilege. The young senator from Massachusetts, Do Joe Kennedy, seems more mainstream than Johnson, and he's getting more publicity of late. Kennedy's good looks and easy outdoor manner remind you, for some reason, of one of the new, those new mentholated cigarettes. His wife's in a class by herself, a cross between debutante and matron. She's clearly at ease in that chair, wearing virginal white, but also a suggestive half-smile, watching something off camera. It's probably a child, but is he or she coming or going? Jackie's poised there between beauty and enduring motherhood, the road before her longer than we can imagine at what will be soon be the outset of a brand new decade. Thank you. Amy Paston is now going to give you some stories behind some of the pictures and the photographers who took them. Hello. Well, good. This will be just like being at PNP with real photographs. Um, I'm going to offer a uh, photo editor's perspective of the images. Can you hear me? They're tall, so I don't know. Um, but first, I'd really like to thank the publishing office. I'd like to thank Tom, my editor. I'd like to thank Jim, my author. And I'd like to thank everyone in the publishing office, everyone in PNP who gave me a place to work and who just put up with me for months and months while I looked at um, endless images from Look Magazine. Um, I'm going to start. <laughs> with um, an image by Charlotte Brooks, who's really um, somebody people don't know about but really needs to be better understood. Charlotte Brooks took this image of Duke Ellington on the road in 1955. And during her tenure at Look Magazine from 1951 to 1971, Charlotte was the only female photographer on staff. And when I say that, I don't mean that there weren't other female photographers working for Look, but they were freelance, and she was actually a staff member. Um, as she produced more than 450 jobs that are currently here at uh, Prints and Photographs. Look Magazine achieved its highest circulation in the year she was there, growing from 3.7 million in 1954 and peaking at 7.75 million in 1969. And it graced the coffee tables and dens of middle class families throughout the United States. Brooks's contribution to the magazine and the field of photojournalism is especially significant because she defied traditional roles of gender, female, religion, Jewish, and sexual orientation, lesbian, to achieve success. Her artful and intimate images were so closely identified with the look style that she was often referred to as Miss Look instead of Miss Brooks. At Look, Brooks became one of the guys, refusing to be pigeonholed as a photographer of women's subjects. She volunteered for adventurous, sometimes dangerous assignments, underwater shoots in the deep sea, aerial shots from helicopters over LA, and bus tours in the rural segregated south. Here she captures band leader Duke Ellington, Mr. Hi-Fi of 1955, in a pickup baseball game with members of his orchestra during their tour through Florida. He was at the top of his game in the music world, but he had to stay at the Astor, a colored motel, as the sign indicates, in segregated Gainesville. Mm -hmm. so, the next image that Tom is bringing over is um, from a helicopter evacuation in Korea in 1952. This was taken by Earl Thiessen. This is a real-life episode of MASH, but without the humor. Korean War soldier Private Arthur Nelson, his legs smashed by Chinese burp gun fire, lies on a litter while his buddies watch a helicopter pilot fix a strap for the hop to the field hospital. Look photographer Thiessen was there to capture the scene, the soldiers huddling around their falling comrade. Note the soldier at left, his hand touching the back of the soldier in front of him, a gesture of comfort and reassurance, and the soldier kneeling before Private Nelson 
wishing him farewell or maybe just to keep your chin up. Thiessen's poignant photo does not glorify combat, but speaks to the very personal tragedy of war. This same photographer looking for look on, working for look on the West Coast would photograph Audrey Hepburn, Perry Como, Elizabeth Taylor, and Marilyn Monroe. How did he end up in a battle zone so far from Hollywood? It seems that like many of his colleagues, a good eye, strong sense of compassion, and ability to become one with his surroundings stood him in good stead. He traveled the world and photographs hun photographed hundreds of stories for look. And as his daughter recalled, dad loved his job and how many people can say that? He was so enthusiastic about a new lens, about a new story. I think he would vibrate with enthusiasm when he knew he got the shot, when he knew his subject was captured on film. Bill Haley. So um, Bill Haley and the Comets and Laverne Bar uh, Baker performed at the Sport Arena in Pencil Hershey, Pennsylvania on April 23, 1956. And the image that Tom is holding shows that they really rocked the place. <laughs> um, look, photographer Ed Feingersh was there, and he trained his lens on this writhing, shirtless teenager completely caught up in the moment. And more than any other shot he took of the band performing that night, I only, I only know this because I looked at thousands of them, this image conveys the raw power of a new music genre, rock and roll. It was an all-body liberating experience, and it was this kind of behavior that led many parents of 50 teenagers to equate rock and roll with the devil. 1956 was Elvis's big year, but Haley had staked a claim to rock and roll two years before with the release of Rock Around the Clock, which was recorded in 1954. That anthem was number one on the charts for eight weeks and went on to sell 25 million copies worldwide. I've looked all over for a bio of photographer Ed Feingersh, but I haven't found one except for a posting on Facebook by a man who says that Feingersh was his Boy Scout troop leader and photographer teacher. He claims that Feingersh was a Holocaust survivor who came to the U.S. after World War II and studied photography at NYU. The Library of Congress only has three look assignments by Feingersh, who is said to have died young. And now we're going we're gonna to look at one that Jim also talked about. It's um, of a lingerie saleswoman in 1950, an unforgettable image by Stanley Kubrick. Stanley Kubrick's films, Lolita, Dr. Strangelove, 2001, A Space Odyssey, A Clockwork Orange, and The Shining, defined an era. But before he made films, Kubrick taught himself how to use a camera, and in 1945, at age 17, sold an image to Look Magazine for $25. He eventually became a full-time staff member uh, photographer for Look, and he was the youngest ever hired. He worked there until 1950 when he left to pursue the projects that would earn him fame. The photographs show an emerging talent. The dramatically lit, strongly composed pictures engage the viewer. Even for this shoot of a lingerie saleswoman seen here appraising her wares on a live chain-smoking model in Chicago in 1949, there is an eeriness and tension between the two women as well as between them and the viewer that is powerful and memorable. The model, front-facing, semi-clothed, and ensconced in smoke, is bold in every way. But the ambition and judgment of the saleswoman at the desk, seated and more passive, is what really counts in this business. The story, Traveling Saleswoman, ran in Look in March 1950 and documented the work and travels of Sue Hughes, who was em employed for the Form Fit Company in Chicago. Look was progressive in that they covered the lives of working women in the 50s, when women's careers were often trivialized or simply ignored. Men in hats. We've seen this um, again, you know, trying to get uh, sometimes what, why I chose it and what Jim wrote really meshed, and sometimes, you know, they didn't, but it didn't matter. <laughs> but I think we agreed on this one. Um, so this is by Bob Sandberg from 1954. Men came back from World War II and went to work. They married, had children, and by the early 50s moved their families to the suburbs. 
Look photographer Bob Sandberg documented the new suburban experience in a February 9, 1954 story that focused on Park Forest, Illinois. This was a planned community that offered housing for veterans. It was just outside of Chicago, and it was a paradise for the new middle class. There were modern homes, green lawns, schools, parks, and regular train service into the city. Here we see the Park Forest army of commuters in the uniform of the time, hats, suits, skinny ties, and a few shirtwaist dress, dresses for secretaries, all reminiscent of TV's Mad Men. They have just streamed from a train onto the platform, which can barely accommodate all the bodies, and there's a gridlock waiting to descend the stairs to the station. The image has great perspective, with tiny hats visible all the way to the horizon. The composition stresses the herd mentality of these workers who seem to have sacrificed their individuality for suburban life. Sandberg was an early employee of the magazine, starting as a darkroom operator shortly after it published its first issue in 1937. He became an accomplished photographer, staying on for 32 years, almost until the magazine ceased operations in 1971. In addition to documenting the lives of many Americans whose names we'll never know, he photographed scores of celebrities from Jackie Robinson to Jack Kennedy. Okay. Um, the next image is uh, by John Vachon. He's one of my favorite photographers in the library's collection, and you probably know him as a farm security administration photographer, but then afterwards he went to work for a look. Um, let's see her. So I'm going to read you a little bit of what the catalog record says for this image. The catalog record is the thing you find online under the job number for, for each uh, look project. It, as follows, it says, photographs show African Americans and segregation in the South, primarily in Mississippi include signs indicating where African Americans can enter establishments, purchase movie tickets, eat, use toilets, purchase a house, be buried. African American men and women in a variety of occupations, street sweeping, digging ditches, picking cotton, hotel bell top, shoe shiner, pumping gas, farmers selling tobacco, African American women caring for white children, men and women in pickup truck for day work, African American children, attending school, um, African-American men lounging outside stores, side view of city bus with whites seated in front, blacks in rear, also dilapidated housing. So you get the idea of what all these contact sheets I was reviewing um, were showing me, and of course this was an unforgettable image. As I said, John Vashon was a photographer with the FSA, uh, a New Deal program, um, before going to uh, look and then on to Standard Oil. Actually, he went to Standard Oil, I'm sorry, and then going to look. The article accompanying his images was by an African-American journalist called Carl, named Carl Rowan. Look sometimes was liberal, and they titled this piece, How Far From Slavery, and they ran it in their January 15, 1952 issue. When I first saw the images, I couldn't believe they had been shot in the 50s. They so reminded me of photographs from the early 20th century depicting the desperate poverty and overt abuse of Southern blacks. How ironic that the pristine and pudgy little white children in this photo, at their tender ages, had more rights and privileges than the black women who posed a little sheepishly, it seems, for Mr. Vachon. <clears throat> and I'm going to close with the quintessential 50s image. I don't know why this says 50s to me totally. And again, this was taken in Park Forest, Illinois, um, uh, The Mom in the Pool from 1954. The job uh, was credited to both Bob Sandberg and Jack Starr, so I don't really know who, which one of them took this picture. Like the earlier view of suburban commuters wearily alighting from a local train, this image was taken in Park Forest. For those who didn't commute, like the stay-at-home mom, there was a different kind of security and sameness to the suburban experience. Park Forest was safe for kids. There, outside one's tidy new home, you and your neighbors could enjoy each other's company while watching over the children. Maybe, if you were lucky, you could steal a few minutes to yourself reading a magazine in your son's kiddie pool, 
while the kids splashed each other mercilessly in the pool belonging to the people next door. Then one imagines you could haul the kids inside, bathe them, and feed them an early supper while you donned a shirtwaist dress and pearls and prepared supper for the tired husband who would soon walk through the front door. The photo highlights the best and worst of the decade for women, having it all but perhaps wanting something different. I always wonder when I look at this image if the mom in the pool would rather be making waves somewhere else. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Amy and Jim will take some questions from you. Uh, we have about uh, 10 minutes. And uh, just a note before we start the questions about the books that are on sale today. Uh, we discovered last week a production error in the book. And we have the correct pages inserted in all the books that are for sale today. It's only two pages, and it's right at the end of the book. So if you find those two pages that seem to be odd pages, that's what they're doing there. Those are the correct photo credits for the book. Jim, Amy, come on and back up. Let's answer some questions. <laughs> you choose. <laughs> Um, let's see, some of them are easier to look at than others. Yes, you could if you, um, you have to have a reader card and you have to sign in with a purpose as to what your research is. But yes, I mean, that m many of them exist as context sheets that can be served in the prints and photographs reading room. There are others, however, the color images um, are stored off-site, and those are much harder to see. So, um, but there's plenty that you could probably look at. Um, I think they ask you what your research purpose is, but I don't know if anyone in prints and photographs is here who could address that. But I believe that I believe that if you have a reader card and you're careful with the material, you can request the material. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, we probably both can talk to that. I, Amy, excuse me, could you just repeat the question? Oh, sure. I'm sorry. That it, the question was about the difference between look and most people think of Life magazine also as a magazine of the 50s and how were they different and if we could characterize them. Um, I always think of look as the poor man's life. I'm not sure that's really accurate, but I think it was a more appeal to working class and dealt more with small town America and small town life. Uh, uh, it seems like Life magazine had the more big name photographers. They certainly had Margaret Burke White. Um, they had Gordon Parks. They had others. Um, we see the life images more because they belong to Getty Images now and they're often on the internet and they're, uh, you know, they're part of a, a big corporate entity. Um, but I do think of life as being uh, kind of a more upper class view of American life at the time than look. I don't know if you have a feeling. No, no, I agree with that. Uh, also, in addition, uh, life was reflected Henry Luce's view of the triumphant century, triumphant civiliz American civilization. In fact, it was the official view of the 50s that has endured. Look Magazine inadvertently just said, let's look at the other side a little bit. Uh, and that's, I think that's the big difference between them. It probably, Look probably is a blue collar life, but it's a more interesting, in some ways, scruffier publication, but it was a little more daring. Um, I love your uh, cover photo. Can you uh, tell us why you chose that and can you tell us a little bit about the photograph? Yes, the photograph was part of a story about Florida, and it was just about middle class Americans visiting Florida. I actually did not choose that as the cover photo, and that is a very uh, 
interesting example of what happens in book publishing. Um, we had many images that we liked for the cover, and it was so hard to choose just one. We wanted a, a not necessarily a recognizable or political or celebrity image for the cover, but just something that showed 50s life. Um, the, de the designer chose that picture, and I love it because, you know, there's like people diving off the diving board, just like jumping into a new decade, um, yet it looks 50s. The color is kind of retro, and that is the accurate color of the photograph. So I'm very pleased with the way it worked out. Just parenthetically, this it's very interesting if you if you look at that uh, photograph, the people are not it's women being thrown into the new decade by men <laughs> on two levels on the top board there's a sort of menacing guy in pink uh, shorts, and below there's a sort of upright uh, Ivy League type, but the women are definitely at a disadvantage and there's a certain tension there that I think possibly the designer overlooked. <laughs> so it, I think it may, to me that's what makes the photograph interesting. Okay. Anything else? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, Amy, and Tom. Tom, we're so glad you're taller than I am. <laughs> you did a great job. Uh, this is the kind of program we especially enjoy hosting at the Center for the Book because it does, exp it describes and in some ways exploits in the best sense of the word uh, collections that are not generally available. And I think the observations about, for example, look and life and the part these magazines played in our life and then the part that the Library of Congress got a hold of, which happens to be Look Magazine, uh, also gives you a sense of the variety of the collections in the Library of Congress, which, as you, I think most of you know, we do have some funds to purchase materials, but we look for big gifts, and we don't take every gift we are offered, but nonetheless, when a good fortune comes along and the right people are behind it and the right curators are here and the right experts are here to help us make choices. It really is one of the ways that the Library of Congress itself uh, makes an important contribution to uh, American culture and American life. So we hope that, um, I know that you enjoyed it. Uh, we now move the last part of every Books and Beyond program, which is a book signing where you'll have a chance to continue your discussion with the uh, authors and the writers uh, and the editor, Tom. And uh, we hope that you will buy the book at the Library of Congress discount, have it signed while you're here, and always think that Christmas is on its way, so you might get a second or a third book as well. Uh, let's one more time please uh, thank uh, Amy, Jim, and Tom. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.